All right. All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us for our virtual seminar series here at the CDRE. Uh, we just started recording this. It will be available on YouTube at a later point in time. Our speaker today is Elise Stelly. Uh, she's actually a graduate here from uh, the Millersville Masters in Emergency Management Program at the CDRE. Uh, Elise currently works as an Emergency Management Specialist and Community Resilience Planner with Tetra Tech. Uh, she's uh, worked on a variety of projects for the public sector clients, state, county, municipal levels, uh, utilized her research abilities, writing skills, and attention to detail to develop and review a variety of emergency management, community resilience, and community development plans with a strong focus across the Mid-Atlantic region. Uh, since she's become a certified floodplain manager at CFM in August 2014, Elise has become involved in the integration of floodplain management and emergency management. She currently is part of an innovative initiative with Dauphin County to help assess municipal eligibility for the community rating system, which offers flood insurance discounts to property owners and jurisdictions with strong flood mitigation and control programs. Elise is, or Elise has uh, also worked on two floodplain management plans uh, as well as several county multi-hazard mitigation plans. She's from Lancaster, and as I said, she completed her master's from Millersville in 2014. Uh, and she's achieved the summa cum laude honors for her undergraduate degrees also through Millersville. So uh, again, uh, we're going to give uh, Elise, without further ado, a chance to talk about her subject today, which is floodplain management, flood insurance reform, and the community rating system. All right, Elise, it's all yours. Elise will be right back in in one moment. She's lost her audio. So hold on one second. While we wait, I'll just uh, let you know that uh, we will have one more seminar. It's scheduled for Friday, November 20th. Uh, same time, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, Eastern Standard Time, as we change those clocks back. Uh, I think it's next weekend we do that. Uh, Jeremy Young will be presenting on disaster planning for historic properties, integrating hazard mitigation and historic preservation in Pennsylvania. So uh, one more big one for the fall. And then uh, we're actually working uh, pretty extensively to try to put together a virtual seminar series for the spring. And that might actually last just for the month of February. We might go back to back, week to week uh, to try things out there. Uh, so we're currently working on that. So while we wait for uh, Elise to come in, I just wanted to kind of leave this slide up for you. Uh, we'll show it again at the end of the program. Elise, if you're able to talk, uh, we're ready. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. OK, excellent. Sorry about that. I spilled coffee in my computer the other day, and I think I might still be having issues with my mouse because of that. Um, right, thank you, everyone, for joining today. Um, and Jeff, I'll let you know when I need the, the slide switched. Um, if you can let me know through the comments, I had to put my computer on mute because I'm getting feedback otherwise from calling in with the phone. Um, but if you could go to the first slide of my presentation, that would be great. Okay. Um, as Jeff introduced, I currently work for a company called Tetra Tech, and we do a lot of emergency management planning, community development planning, and also the structural components associated with once you have the plan in place, how do you implement the recommendations. Um, one of our big focuses right now is with floodplain management. And I think a lot of times this area gets overlooked because it typically gets linked more with community development and not so much emergency management, but they have a very close relationship. Uh, that's part of why I wanted to focus on that. There's also a lot going on at the moment um, legislatively with changes to the flood insurance program that makes this an important area for emergency managers to be familiar with. Um, next slide. There's four main areas that I wanted to focus on today, uh, just to give you a broad overview. These are floodplain management, flood insurance, uh, the National Flood Insurance Program, why there's flood insurance reform occurring right now and why we need it, and then the community rating system, which is a potential solution to help with some of the, the current issues with the flood insurance program. Next slide. 
So floodplain management. Um, as I mentioned before, a lot of times floodplain management gets overlooked to some extent. Why, why are floods important? What's the big deal? Um, floods, a lot of times, especially with emergency management, the, the technological hazards and the man-made hazards are flashier, they're more attention grabbing, but it's usually the natural disasters that have the biggest impact. Uh, next slide. Floods in particular are really important for us to pay attention to. There's a couple of reasons behind this. They're one of the most common natural hazards in the United States. Almost every state has to deal with flooding in some form or another. Um, floods, usually when we think of floods, we think of a river overflowing its bank, or maybe coastal flooding as the result of a hurricane, but it's actually a much more broad hazard than just that. There's the riverine flooding that I mentioned with the river stream over flooding its banks. There's flash flooding that can occur during an unexpected storm, ice jams, snow melt flooding, stormwater or urban drainage issues. Um, stormwater and urban drainage is also a topic that I think we don't necessarily always think about as emergency managers because it ties into, again, more of the community development and planning. A lot of times um, in emergency management, you have to work very closely with the land use planners in your community because you're trying to develop your community in a way to mitigate and prevent hazards from having a significant impact. Um, and if you have a lot of impervious cover, a lot of road, road surfaces or concrete, that especially in city areas, um, water can't drain after a storm, and this can cause standing water to get stuck in streets, and then people risk having car damage, or water can creep into basements. Um, so that's part of why it's so important to have processes in place to manage stormwater as well, which can linger a lot longer than just a regular flood event, or can be caused by even a, a regular rainstorm, not a severe storm. Um, flooding is also important because it ties into a lot of other hazards. Um, usually natural hazards, it can weaken land stability and increase the chance for landslides. Um, on the coast or along riverbanks, it can cause erosion. Um, usually there's utility interruptions involved um, in the Harrisburg area during Irene and Lee. Not only were these utility interruptions having to do with power and electric, but there were also concerns about sewer line ruptures, which can tie into public health concerns. Um, if there's sewage backflow into people's basements, um, and then you get contaminate, contaminated water where people can get sick. Uh, and ironically enough, you would think floods, what do floods have to do with fires? Uh, but if you have utility out, outages and wires getting soaked, you can actually increase the chance of a fire in a building as well from a flood. Floods are also important because the amount of damage that they create, um, they have the potential for both property damage and loss of life and injury. And because they are so widespread, particularly in Pennsylvania, I'm not sure if everyone in the call is in Pennsylvania since Millersville has um, an online program. There can be people from across the country. But Pennsylvania's top um, hazard for the state is floods, and it's also considered one of the top states in the country for flood-related losses. The other really well-known one is Illinois, uh, especially in the Chicago area. Next slide, please. So that's just a basic overview of why we need to consider floods. Um, this ties into, well, yes, we understand floods are important. They're dangerous. They can cause a lot of problems. How do we address them? And that's floodplain management. Um, as with all aspects of emergency management, we're looking at both or looking at prevention, preparation, mitigation, response, and recovery. Um, floodplain management focuses more on the prevention and preparation for a flood event by look and mitigation by looking at what can you do in advance to reduce both the risk of flooding and the potential impact. Um, most actions are divided into four different categories. And they're planning and regulatory, which are the documents and laws that are put into place in a community to help encourage higher standards for building construction, things like that. Natural systems protection, which looks at um, encouraging the natural and beneficial functions of floodplains, uh, keeping parks available as open space so that floodwaters have a space to drain to to avoid stored, or stormwater. 
um, looking at how by protecting natural systems we encourage groundwater aquifers to recharge, things like that, structural and infrastructure projects. These are usually what most people think of with floodplain management. That's building a dam or a levee or um, adding culverts and things like that, things that are very visible. And then education and outreach and letting people know both in the field professionally and everyday residents why it's important to prepare for floods and what you can do yourself to help with that problem. Um, and this is all very similar. I know that there have been presentations on mitigation before. So if, if you've um, attended any of the virtual seminar series presentations on hazard mitigation or if you have looked up your county or community's hazard mitigation plan, you'll see that most communities address all of their hazards in this way and they look at dividing potential activities and efforts into these four categories, which is the current FEMA guidelines. Um, to have the maximum impact for hazard management. So next slide. The National Flood Insurance Program is probably one of the best known uh, regulatory tools available to communities for helping manage flood damage. And basically what this is, is it's a federal pr program to provide flood insurance to participating communities. Uh, because floods are so damaging and so expensive, insurance companies won't touch them. If a flood comes through, if something, even 20, 30 years ago, something half the size of Irene or Lee came through, without something like the flood, um, flood insurance program in place, insurance companies wouldn't have been able to absorb the losses of trying to give people that had flood damage their money back. It would have wiped them out. So for that reason, the government looked around and was like, we can't, floods are, are too important a hazard. We can't let them destroy people's livelihoods. They put into place this program called the NFIP. And basically what it is, is it's an agreement between the federal government and the municipality that the municipality will adopt, will adopt and enforce a flood management ordinance that meets certain regulations. And I have the, the reference there in the chart from the CFR, um, FEMA will then monitor their ability to meet these regulations through something called a Community Assistance Visit, or CAV. Those are supposed to be about every five years. Unfortunately, in practicality, with FEMA having limited resources and limited um, people that are available to go out with how many municipalities there are in certain states, there are some communities that haven't had a CAV for 20, 30 years, or even a couple um, in this area that have never had a CAV. But ideally, their goal is to have somebody go out and evaluate a community once every five years to make sure that they're in compliance and that the flood hazard risk isn't greater than it needs to be. And as a result of a municipality agreeing to do this, the government makes sure makes available flood insurance to residents in that community, providing them additional financial resource. Um, a lot of people don't realize this with flood insurance, that it's actually federally backed and not privately backed. And that's because when you buy your flood insurance, it's still done through a private insurance company. Basically what they do is they have something called a write your own policy that they develop and it's based on the agreement with the federal government. But wherever you go for your insurance policy, if you live in a municipality that doesn't participate in the NFIP, you are not able to get flood insurance even if your neighbor one township over is just because it's a different community. Um, next slide. So here's a bit more information on the NFIP. It was officially established in August 1968. Um, in 1973, because as with anything, participation is always the biggest challenge. Not enough people or not enough communities were signing up to join the NFIP, which forced the 1973 changes because the federal government didn't want people to not be able to get flood insurance. And if people didn't know about it, they wouldn't be able to get it. So they added caveats such as if you don't participate, then you're not able to get federally financed loans, which has caused a bit of controversy because it, in effect, in some ways, requires people to participate in the National Flood Insurance Program and to get a policy so that they can get things like a federally backed mortgage when you buy your house. And it, it's kind of a, it's a controversy because where do you draw the line? You don't want to risk somebody's 
house entire savings being wiped out because their house is destroyed by floods, floodwaters, but at the same time, you also don't want to make something a requirement for everybody. So, um, however, that's been in place for um, over 30 years. So it's, it's a um, policy that will most likely be staying that way because it has encouraged more people to join. Um, and I have some of the drawbacks of non-participation that in addition to not being eligible for federal loans like a federal um, backed mortgage, you're also not available for certain disaster assistance. So a lot of times after a disaster, you'll see if somebody has flood damage, they'll end up signing up for flood insurance policies so that they are able to get that post-disaster assistance. And hopefully thereby in the future, if there is another flood event, then they're already in a better position to avoid being impacted. Uh, next slide. So overall, the NFIP has a lot of benefits to it. Um, the most notable one is the fact that it lets people have a way to get flood insurance. Um, but there's some other more subtle benefits. It increases, um, it promotes non-structural measures for flood plain management. It looks at regulations, at educating people not just the structural measures. One of the concerns with only using structure and infrastructure projects like culverts or elevating roadways and things like that is, or levees, is in some, to some extent they're a band-aid. Um, because of the way society develops, it makes sense to have all of our towns and areas near rivers and near waterways, especially for communities in this area that have been around for a couple hundred years because the, water, the main river was a way a lot of goods were transported down that way. It was a, a solid resource, but because of that, all of the houses in those areas are then more vulnerable to flooding. So most flood control measures are, that are structural are temporary measures that they can only do so much, and there's always the chance that there will be a flood that can surpass them, that the waters will be too high and will overtop the levee, or be too much for the drainage system to handle. So by looking at non-structural measures such as education, um, increased regulations, you can try and find ways around that to reduce the overall risk. Uh, and I think everything else is probably pretty well summarized on that list, so I'm not going to go over them in too much detail. So next slide. So now that I've gone over the flood insurance program, I mean, I'm assuming you guys agree with me. I can't hear you since I have you on unmute, but it sounds like a pretty good program, so why do we need to reform it? What's, what's the big deal? Well, um, next slide. The big deal is, unfortunately, because flood damage is so expensive, the NFIP is currently over $25 billion in debt to the U.S. Treasury. Um, a lot of this is due to Katrina, to Irene and Lee, to Sandy. Um, and a lot of this money has already been paid back to the Treasury. But with these major flood events occurring and with the fact that they're starting to occur more and more frequently, there's been this realization that the program's not sustainable. And when the NFIP was developed, it was in, originally envisioned to be a program that, like any regular insurance program, you pay in, that money is invested and saved over time. So that way when there is an event and people need assistance, the money is already available to pay people back. Well, that's not, unfortunately, not able to happen because of how expensive the floods are. And if they continue getting worse, this problem itself will also continue getting worse. Um, there's a couple of reasons why that's so. This goes into, uh, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with the flood insurance rate maps. This is something that if you want to go find out where, what the risk is for the area that you live in, for flooding, you can go onto FEMA's website and they have something called the Map Service Center, and it's msc.fema.gov, I believe. And you can pull up your address and find out what flood zone you live in. There's a bunch of different letters that categorize the risk of your flood zone. Um, and then FEMA uses these maps, which are called flood insurance rate maps or firms, to evaluate how much you need to pay in flood insurance. And your flood insurance rate is based off of your risk level. However, a lot of people own homes that were built before these flood insurance rate maps were developed. Most of them um, came out in the 70s, and then they've been updated over time. Um, I'm not sure about Lancaster County, but Dauphin County's flood insurance rate maps were last updated in 2012. They take into account new development, um, any changes in 
waterway courses, things like that. Um, but because of the fact that we have so many older buildings, again, especially in this area, but all over the country, that were already built before this program came into place, if they were to pay their actual flood risk rate, they would be paying incredibly high levels. And for that reason, when the NFIP was first developed, all of these houses that were built before the maps were given subsidy rates. Um, but again, because these same houses, because they were built before the, the maps came out and appropriate risk analysis could be done on where to put development, they're also the same houses that are most likely to get flooded. So this means that of all of the policies that are currently out for the flood insurance program, almost one in five are at subsidized rates. But almost half of them are the ones that are actually submitting claims. So the flood insurance program, if it didn't have that to consider, would actually be a sustainable program. It wouldn't be overspending when people would be submitting claim requests for their um, properties for damage. So one of the other issues as well is, as I said, like the flood insurance rate maps are updated over time because more developments are built, more roads are built, and this can change where the flood boundaries are because the more development you have, the greater increase there is for drainage issues or stormwater runoff or for the flood to just have a more significant impact. Um, so you might have bought your house in 1995 and the maps are updated. When you bought your house, you checked, it's fine, I'm not in the floodplain, it's, it's good, but now the maps have been updated and with all this new development, I'm in the floodplain, but I didn't have control over that. Like I did, I did my due diligence and made sure when I bought, I wasn't buying in a, a risk area. So what P FEMA did for those properties is they grandfathered them in and those properties also paid a subsidized rate because of the fact that they were not in the flood zone when they were first built. Next slide. Um, now that I just went over all the reasons why the NFIP is so overspent, as I said, the realization came that this isn't sustainable, but the program itself is too important to get rid of. Um, in May of 2012, the Biggert Waters Act of 2012, abbreviated BW12, uh, was passed. And basically, the initial thought by Congress with this act was, well, the easy way to make this program sustainable is just get rid of all the subsidies and grandfathering and just have everyone actually pay what their risk rate is, and that'll be fine. Um, unfortunately, when they did that, they didn't stop and look at what those rate increases would mean. So you had some people that went from paying like $300 a year in flood insurance to $1,300 a year. And I'm assuming that you guys all would feel the same way I did if all of a sudden I went from having a $300 bill to over $1,000, and especially if a lot of people didn't have any warning. Um, the other issue with this, too, is with the rate increases, a lot of people that live in high-risk flood zones are people that are lower income or lower socioeconomic status, so they're also the people that are least able to afford these rate increases. Um, so Congress realized almost immediately what the impacts of this decision were as people started getting these bills and going, we, we can't afford to pay this. So um, next slide. To try and mitigate that, they passed another act in 2014. And this one is called the Homeowners Flood Insurance Affordability Act. Um, and basically what this did is it put a stopgap on the Bigger Waters Act. Many, um, some of the provisions were repealed. However, the ultimate goal of the act is still the same. It's to get rid of the subsidies and grandfathering associated with the current program. It's just trying to do it in a way that won't bankrupt everybody. So one of the things that they did is instead of everyone going from having a subsidized rate to paying their actual value, it's taking it in steps. So every year, your rate increases to be closer to what your actual risk value is, and it can increase more than 18% annually. Um, the one drawback with this act being passed is even though it helped remove the immediate issue with the flood insurance rate program, it still doesn't change the fact that there's still problems with it. And a lot of people see this act and went, oh, okay, it's fine. The, the government just repealed bigger waters. We don't need to worry about it anymore. 
that's not the case. It actually basically put a five-year stopgap on what would be the same problem. So in five years, the once the rates get up to the actual rates, people are going to be in the, the same spot that they were when the initial act was passed. So currently FEMA is looking at different measures that they can put in place because, um, next slide. Because the NFIP is here to say it's, it plays too important of a role. Flood insurance is too important to too many people. They can't get rid of it, but they want to find a way to make it a useful program. Um, so in summary, rates are going to continue to increase. Flood losses are going to continue to increase. We need this program, but we also need a way that people can afford to participate in it. So what can we do? Um, next slide. Uh, there's a couple different things that FEMA is looking at as, uh, um, on the um, Homeowners Insurance Affordability Act. One of the requirements is conducting a five-year study for different options. Um, so FEMA is looking to, into that. Their primary goals, though, and for any emergency managers that do work in hazard mitigation, you probably hear this ad nauseum, but acquisition and demolition, the, the best option to not have to worry about flood insurance and and flood damage is get the houses that are most likely to be damaged out of the floodplain where they can't be damaged. So this is usually a pretty lengthy process. Um, and you have to work with the government. The homeowner has to be willing to have their house bought out to start with. Um, they have to get cha charged a fair market value. It's usually grant funded. Um, and then once the property is acquired and demolished, it has to stay as open space land. It can't be developed into anything else. Um, so this sounds great in theory, and it, there's a lot of reasons why FEMA likes it, but it also doesn't work for every community. One of the reasons is you have some communities that some municipalities that are so small, they're right along the river, that if they were to get rid of every house in the floodplain in their community, they would lose their tax base. So and they already have such limited financial resources to start with that they can't afford to do that. Now, they're kind of caught in a double, a catch-22 at the moment with flood insurance rates rising as well because they're having trouble getting people to move into their communities because people are moving in and not able to afford the flood insurance. So, but if they were to get rid of those houses completely, then they would completely lose the chance of getting any financial resources that way. So one of the other options that FEMA is really interested in now, and this ties back to some of what Jeff said in the beginning, that I'm working on with Tetra Tech is the community rating system or CRS as a possible solution. So I'll go more into what we're doing with CRS in a little bit, but I want to give you a brief overview as to what exactly CRS is. Next slide. So CRS is technically considered part of the National Flood Insurance Program. It is administered by FEMA. But it's typically, if you were to meet somebody involved with CRS, it would be somebody from the Insurance Services Office or ISO. Um, usually when you hear about them, they do a lot of building classification and fire insurance ratings as well. Um, and actually, the CRS program is modeled after the fire insurance rating program for any um, firefighters that may be listening. So, And it encourages um, basically stronger protective measures. Basically what CRS is, is it's an extra credit program for communities that invest in floodplain management. So what do I mean by that? Um, as a student, I was all about, like I loved writing papers. I'm a huge, huge nerd. It's probably part of why I'm a planner now, because I still like writing papers. Um, but I loved extra credit opportunities as a way to get additional points, and CRS basically tries to do the same thing. They tell a municipality, if you go out of your way and invest in extra programs, we want to recognize the time that you're taking, that your staff members are taking, the money that your community is investing, and we want to, to basically compensate you through your residents for taking these extra efforts to reduce your risk. And the way that we do that is by offering um, insurance discounts to residents. Next slide. So I'll show the information on the insurance discounts to residents in a moment, but when CRS, when you go through the CRS program, there's four main areas that you can apply for basically these extra credit, and they're divided then into a further 19 activities. And all of this 
information is also online if you are curious about the specific checks in the boxes that FEMA looks for when they have a CRS application if something's eligible for credit. Um, public information elevation certificates looks at um, building construction and making sure that a building is built at a high enough elevation that it will be over what the estimated flood water rise would be if there were a 100-year flood. Um, map information service is looking at making available the firms, the flood risk maps, insurance rate maps to residents and to people that might be interested in seeing them. Outreach is a couple of different things and that's pretty self-explanatory um, with making sure that the public has an opportunity to learn about not just the importance of floods themselves but what they can do as homeowners or renters to try and reduce their risk to flood. It also includes um, for certain communities there is something called repetitive loss properties and these are properties that experience a certain number of flood damages with a certain cost amount within a five or ten year period and then are classified as either repetitive loss or severe repetitive loss depending on how significant these losses are. And um, going back to what I had said earlier about the, the properties that are most likely to submit claims, these are usually also repetitive loss properties. So these are FEMA's priority. If they can get rid of the repetitive loss properties, have them bought out and demolished so that they're no longer at a risk for flooding, then they're able to reduce the most significant drain for flood insurance and keep people safer because they're no longer living in a high flood risk area. So there's additional outreach requirements for these type of properties where property owners um, have to be notified every year that they have a repetitive loss property. What this means, what are some of the things that they as the property owner can do about it, um, what are some of the options if they're interested in having a buyout and, and moving so that their house can be demolished. Um, and again, this isn't, that's not something that's a requirement just for participation in the flood insurance program. It's only for this community rating system participation. So, um, but yeah, I'm not going to go through all of the activities in specific detail, but if you guys have questions at the end, I can give you a little bit more information. It's basically an attempt by FEMA to be as comprehensive as possible in encouraging flood management. And one of the nice things about the CRS program is it acknowledges every community is a little bit different. So some communities are going to find it easier to implement preparedness measures or regulations. Some might find it easier to do structural projects. So FEMA wants to recognize that not everybody has the same resources available. The important thing is that you're working on reducing your risk. So you can pick and choose which activities work best for your community and apply for credit for that. And there's only two required elements with the CRS program and one is that if you have the repetitive loss properties doing that specific outreach and the other is that you have to maintain the elevation certificates that I mentioned beforehand. Um, next slide. So if a community does all of this, um, as I said, the benefit is that they receive flood insurance discounts and that residents then get discounts off of their premiums. Well, these premium discounts can range anywhere between 5% to 45%. Every community is technically considered a class 10 community. You can pull all of this information up on FEMA's website. Um, if you do go through the list of CRS communities and you see somebody listed as a class 10 community, that means that they were in CRS at some point and for whatever reason failed to maintain compliance with some of the requirements and got knocked back down to a class 10. That's the only time you're actually listed in, in the CRS listing as a class 10. Otherwise, it's just assumed you're a class 10 if you're not listed as anything else. Otherwise, every time you go up a level, you receive an extra 5% discount for your premiums. And there's some caveats to this, as you can see in the bottom. Uh, if you live in a different flood zone or if you live in a non-flood zone and still want to have flood insurance because you have drainage issues or just for peace of mind, you can get flood insurance. Um, and because you already pay lower rates because you have a lower risk, you also get a, a lower discount. But this is the average discount for people in the 100-year flood zone. Um, so it's very appealing. The way that you get points is, or the way that you get the discount is every 500 points worth of credit that you achieve, you move up a level. And it's very easy for a lot of communities to get to a class nine or eight. A lot of times they're already doing things and don't even realize that they can get credit for them. Um, it's much more difficult 
to get to the higher classes. And as I listed, there is actually only one class one in the entire country. There's only three class twos. And um, they're all out west, like Washington, Texas, those areas. And a lot of that is because a lot of the communities in those areas are newer. We're already aware of some of the impacts of developing um, and land use management, especially with floodplain management. It was easier to start from the beginning to guide their development to be out of hazard zones. But there's a lot of effort and a lot of work that they have to put in every year to be able to maintain their, their discount. Um, so, but FEMA's overall goal, because it's so easy for most communities to get into the CRS program, and a lot of times they don't even realize this, is to try and get more and more communities aware that this is an option and to encourage them to apply for a class 8 or a class 9 rating and then be able to get at least some of the discount. Um, next slide. So a lot of communities that had previously passed on CRS are now considering it because of the rising cost of flood insurance rates that this might be a way for their residents to, with the, the reform that they can still be able to not, not be as impacted so much financially. And then it has the side benefit of encouraging continued activities and, continue, and more and more flood control. Um, and again, by doing this project, it's not going to eliminate all of the impacts from CRS, move, um, from the flood insurance reform, getting rid of subsidies and moving to the full risk rates, but it will hopefully help reduce the impact. Um, and just as a comparison, and one of the reasons why FEMA thinks this could be a really good opportunity is there are a lot of people that aren't taking advantage of this yet, or a lot of municipalities. So even though in the U.S. there are over 22,000 municipalities that participate in the NFIP, only 5% of them are actually in CRS. But despite this low number, over two-thirds of all flood insurance policies that individual residents, like people like you and I have, are people that live in CRS communities. And a lot of that is because there's that increased emphasis on public education and outreach. Um, so how this ties into what we're working on at my current company is we're actually looking at a lot of times when a municipality is looked at CRS, part of why they've passed on it is, oh, well, we only have two or three staff people in our entire municipality. We don't have the time. We don't have the resources. Um, to even look to see if we're eligible and, and what we can do. And a lot of, as you can probably tell just from this presentation, a lot of floodplain management ends up being very technical and zoning and insurance. So there's a lot of involvement with the code enforcement official, with the building official. And if you have the same person that's already trying to, to do too much with limited resources, just the thought of it can be a little bit overwhelming. Um, but once you're in the CRS program and know what to expect, it's pretty easy to maintain because basically you're not doing you're doing everything that you're already doing. You just have to make sure that you're documenting everything accurately. Um, so what we're looking at doing is approaching this from a county level. And currently one of the initiatives that we're working on is it's with Dauphin County in central Pennsylvania. And um, the county is sponsoring all of the municipalities that are interested in looking at CRS. We completed a phase one assessment, which there were about 20 communities that were interested in the phase one part. We went through and met with everyone and saw, okay, what is your basic flood risk? Um, are you in the NFIP? Do you have any compliance issues? What does your flood ordinance look like? Does this meet all of FEMA's regulations? And what else are you doing? Do you have any outreach projects in? Are you doing any other hazard projects? Um, what type of projects are they? Are they planning type projects? Are they emergency services? Are they training? Things like that. And just trying to get a, a baseline on where each community is with their floodplain management. The second part of the project, which we're getting ready to kick off, is actually working with everyone that is then interested in applying for CRS. And we're going to help them with their application, with working with FEMA. Um, and getting through all of the, basically the hoops of trying to apply for a federal program like this and get them familiar with the process so that way once they're in, they know what to expect and they know what they need to do and won't feel like there's too much to have to handle. Um, 
and our main focus with this project is how it, um, looking at that chart that had that 1 through 10 rating is getting the communities in at a class 9 or a class 8 so that they can understand the program, become familiar with it. And some of the communities that we're working with already do a lot in place. As I said, a lot of them are eligible for CRS. They already have everything in place that they need. They just haven't gone through the actual process of applying because they haven't been familiar with the program or have had limited staffing. So they might actually choose to go for a higher level once they've been in the program for a couple of years. But we want this to be a long term solution, so we want to make sure that we get them in and familiar with the program and then they can work to go up step by step. Um, and Dauphin County, what's cool, because again, this is only 45 minutes away from Millersville, so you guys can think about that the next time you drive up to 283, I guess. Um, but it's a, it's caught national attention. As I said, FEMA is really interested in promoting CRS and seeing where this goes and if this is something that a lot of municipalities decide to join in on seeing what the impact is, if this is something that they can start promoting around the country as a way to help minimize the impact of all the flood insurance reform. So, and there may be some other flood insurance reform changes as well. They're still evaluating what they want to do. Um, and it's definitely a good area to keep up on as an emergency manager and to be aware of what might be changing, especially when you start working in a, a local emergency management office. Uh, next slide, please. So basically, in summary, um, for today, floodplain management with floods, they're a major hazard. They tie into a lot of other hazards. It's something that we need to be very aware of as emergency managers. And we should be, as emergency managers, we need to make sure that we're working with planning offices, with development and grants offices, with building inspectors, with codes enforcement to create as comprehensive a program as possible. Um, the National Flood Insurance Program is one of the best ways to help manage floodplain management from a regulatory measure because it gives people a way to receive flood insurance and thus not be as severely impacted from flood damage. Um, unfortunately, because it's not currently sustainable, Congress and FEMA are looking at ways to mitigate this. Um, unfortunately, either way, this is going to lead to rising rates. And hopefully CRS will be a potential solution for some of the challenges imposed by this reform. And either way, it encourages a stronger flood management program and offers incentives for residents and for communities to engage in floodplain management. So that's just a really quick, really brief overview. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'm going to turn the mute back off my laptop so I can hear them and I can try and give you more specifics if you want to know. Okay, I just turned my Holy, laptop. you might be able to hear us through your phone. Uh, are you able to? Yes, actually. Okay, yeah, thank that, you. That's that a might lot be more, more helpful convenient for us. than having this um, Well, some of the students, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> uh, the system has uh, been a little buggy uh, for, for all of us at one point. Um, so one of the questions I want to ask, um, you said about two-thirds of the communities have taken part in this, uh, this new system, this CRS system. Um, do you see FEMA or any other uh, agency trying to, to mandate this um, to make sure everyone's on it as part of a, a way to help with that flood insurance program debt, or um, do you think it will still remain a voluntary thing over the next couple of years? Um, I think it's going to remain voluntary. It's one of the, basically, sorry, I'm looking for the, the slide where I have the 66% so I can respond accurately. I might have to, oh, there we go. It's uh, slide 18. Thank you. Um, even, and even though um, the National Flood Insurance Program, people think of it as a requirement because it's a requirement if you want to get a federally backed mortgage or um, federal disaster assistance, technically having a flood insurance policy is actually still voluntary as well, which is why I don't think CRS will ever become a requirement either. Um, and the other fact is the National Flood Insurance Program for a municipality to participate, they have to meet certain minimum regulations um, in the CFR, uh, and those are all documented in your municipality's flood ordinance. And most communities, if you go on to their website, they'll have a link to their flood ordinance or to their online code. And if you are looking for fascinating reading, 
I know it can be a bit dry to go through, but you can see what all of those requirements are as well. Um, but usually it has to do with things like who is the floodplain administrator in the community, what are the requirements, um, what does the community require with regards to reviewing permits, um, and a lot of times the, a community might also have this ordinance under their zoning chapter because it ties into building construction a lot and zoning and, and construction, well, development in general. Um, but there's certain areas in the ordinance that actually CRS will give you additional points for because they encourage higher standards. That's one of the other reasons why I don't think it would necessarily become a requirement because then you're basically requiring those higher standards and not giving a community reason to keep going past that. Does that make sense? I think it does. And I, I would say um, it's just an interesting way to kind of look at it. Um, didn't really even realize that was out there. Mm -hmm. I, I think the other question I had, and, and we'll continue to open it up to other people if they'll type in or they'll uh, speak up. Um, you know, there'll, there'll be a couple of things. If you can't read it, I'll, I'll read it for you. The, well, the one other thing that it, uh, I was kind of thinking, I know you said in the beginning there was some trouble uh, about acquiring uh, properties, uh, you know, because there's some issues with that uh, to help with the mitigation side of things. But do you think that there's there's any uh, push to try to acquire problem properties, um, maybe after let's say the resident dies or gets inherited by someone else, or there's there's a time or date put on that to really start pushing people out of these areas that we just know to be uh, flooding um, hot spots um, in order to get people out of that region, so we're not constantly paying to repair and uh, replace some of their damaged properties and goods. Yes, uh, absolutely. Like That is FEMA's top priority even more than CRS. If they could get rid of all of the houses in the repetitive loss areas, um, I mean ideally the floodplain in general, but even if they could get rid of all of the repetitive loss properties, that would be a huge, huge win for them. The reason why it is usually problematic is more at the municipal level and going back to the, as I was talking about, with it reducing their tax base because then they can't build new houses on that area. They're required to keep it as open land and it's it's usually the municipalities that don't want to do it because they can't afford to take the loss of losing those properties. So, But from the federal standpoint, that is absolutely their ideal goal. Great. Uh, there's a, if you can read Sorry, I'm reading, okay, cool. uh, I just want to make sure you're able to see that. Yeah. Um, and just in case somebody isn't, is only on, can't see the, the um, screen, I'm going to read the question aloud. It often seems like taxpayers are put on the hook for flood insurance. Correct me if I'm wrong, but from your presentation, is CRS a means to finally make flood insurance a self-sustaining program without a great deal of taxpayer support. Um, that's kind of the goal with the flood insurance reform in general because of the fact that the flood insurance program has had to keep borrowing from the Treasury and from tax dollars to be able to pay out insurance claims. Um, ideally, as a goal, the flood insurance program shouldn't be drawing on any taxpayer money, regardless of CRS or not. It, it should be entirely self-sustaining that, that if you personally have flood insurance, you are paying into the program so that way if you ever need it, you can take advantage of it. But if I don't have flood insurance, then I shouldn't be impacted either way. That is their ideal goal. Um, so, But because of making all of these reform changes, those rates are going up and it's putting more and more of a burden on the people that do have flood insurance and CRS will hopefully be a way to help mitigate that so that it doesn't make drive people into bankruptcy, which has actually been a concern because people that went from having a $300 bill a year, like let me do the math on um, like a couple hundred dollars a month in flood insurance to all of a sudden a several thousand um, over a year that I think my math was totally off there so totally ignore that but they aren't they can't afford to pay that but now they can't afford to sell their house because anyone that would buy their house in all likelihood would need a mortgage and then to get your mortgage you're required to have flood insurance as one of the conditions for a federally backed mortgage and people aren't going to buy a house where they know that they're going to then be required to have flood insurance that will cost them $1,500 a year if they can move somewhere else where they can pay $300 a year and not need flood insurance at all. So did that answer your question?
Okay, great. Oh, no problem. So, and I know going back to what you say, said about like taxpayers being on the, put on the hook for flood insurance, that's one of the frustrations as well that with them, with flood insurance being tied as a requirement to federally backed mortgages is a lot of people feel that then they don't have a choice about getting flood insurance. And even though it is a huge benefit and if you're impacted by a flood, it's very helpful to have. It's still that home. I don't like being told what I have to do. I, I would like to make the decision myself and that goes back to that can be pretty upsetting for a lot of people. Okay. So, does anybody else have any questions? Um, and if anybody is interested in learning more about floodplain management as well, um, especially for anybody that is still in the emergency management program and looking, I know you hear a lot about, um, oh, Courtney, I'll answer your question in just a second. Um, I know you hear a lot about the CEM designation. You can also look at getting your CSM, which is a certified floodplain manager. And it's similar to the CEM. There's not quite as many requirements for when you go for it. You basically have to sit for an exam, and then there's continuing education credits. And a lot of times when you do it, you can take a two-day class beforehand, and they go over a lot of the technical details of what are the zone risks associated with floodplain management, what are the requirements of if you're, you're flood, a floodplain manager in a community, what are you expected to do, what are the regulations that the government, federal government requires for flood insurance and for flood ordinances, um, how do you read a flood map, how do you read a flood insurance study, which is released with the flood map updates, and that looks at um, a lot of the technical scientific data, what are the elevations, for flood risk, things like that. So, and it's um, trying to remember how many questions, like 120 questions on different areas. And it's nice when you take the test as well, they let you know your breakdown. So you know, okay, I did really well in all of the mapping questions, but not so well in the regulation. So it kind of gives you an area, idea of where you need to focus on too. But um, I think it's a really helpful certification to look at if you're in emergency management, because it helps you show how well-rounded you are as well and that you're not um, that you're looking at comprehensive both natural and man-made hazards, especially with how big an issue flooding is. So, um, Courtney, in response to your question on whether Tetra Tech has anything to do with flood recovery, we do do work with recovery. Um, I'm involved in more of the, the planning side and exercises, so I haven't done anything with that. So I'm, I don't know specifics as to what we've done, but I, I know that we have done things, and I also know that they do a lot of aid work internationally with countries too, which is how the company got into emergency management to start with. All right, thank you. We have uh, about a minute or so left. Uh, I want to spend this time to see if anyone has any other quick little questions here, um, for at least before we let her back into the world of a Friday. Okay, I don't see any microphones or uh, anything typing down there. So at least we appreciate it. Um, thanks for talking about this. It really certainly opened up a lot of uh, yeah, chunks of information, uh, certainly for me. I know that uh, just uh, only knowing about the National Flood Insurance Program uh, to see that there's other things out there that can really help uh, homeowners and communities um, understand flooding better and, and certainly save the money on some insurance policies. Um, we appreciate your time here today. Thank you for coming in. Uh, we still have one more virtual seminar series for the fall. Uh, it will be on Friday, November 20th at 1 o'clock in the afternoon where Jeremy Young will be uh, speaking about disaster planning for historic properties. Uh, we've looked at uh, some library issues uh, and cultural preservation uh, earlier with Leslie Williams, so this will kind of tie into that as well. So hopefully we'll see you back then. And uh, again, Elise, thanks for your time. We appreciate it. And this will be available on YouTube in a couple of days here. We'll put that link out for you. Yes. Thank you guys for having me. If anybody has any questions later on, to email Jeff and he can forward them to me. Cause I think it's an important topic in emergency management just because we don't always think about it. So it's important to remember that we should once in a while too. All right. Thank you, everyone.